This morning I want to speak for just a few minutes on the topic of His Star. Can you say that with me? His Star. It's something that jumped out as I was reading um, this past week, early in the week. From Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Out of the New King James Version. If you have it, would you say amen? amen. If you don't, would you say amen? amen? Okay, there are a couple people who said, we're going to wait on it. It is on the screen. And I say, never take anyone else's word for what the word says. Look it up. Read it for yourself. You need to know it. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. We're going to speak on His star for just a few moments. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Say it. His star in the east and have come to worship Him. Say worship Him. Worship him. Say it again. Worship, worship Him. him. Well, we have come to worship Him. You may be seated this morning if you like. So many times we have rehearsed various passages of the Scripture. I'm going to push that out because I know I'll walk around the pulpit a lot. So many times we have rehearsed a passage of Scripture where it becomes mundane to us. It becomes the norm to us. But I, what I want you to see are just a few things this morning uh, that maybe you, you may have seen before, but there's nothing wrong with refreshing our minds, renewing our spirit with the Word of God. And so we're going to see a couple of things. Uh, when Jesus was about to be born... The Bible tells us that there was a brilliant light in the sky. And it pointed the way for the wise men to be able to find where Jesus was. I believe that this star was more radiant than any that they had seen before. They determined through careful study of the uh, manuscripts and holy uh, passages that this star would signify the birth of a king. Somebody say, he's the king. Yeah. Some scholars tell us that they may have traveled for up to two years to make it from the far east to where Jesus was. So what can we learn from these wise men? What can we learn from their journey? What can we learn from their experience? First of all, Note that they saw something in the sky. That means that they were looking for something. That they were attentive, they were trying to find what God would want them to know and to see. And so the question for us this morning is, did you come looking for something? Did you come expecting and anticipating something from the Lord? Because I believe that every time that we gather together, every time we open up this Bible of ours, that God is wanting to show us something that is unique, that is a revelation into our lives, that is applicable, applicable to us. Uh, and so this morning, what are you expecting? Did you come this morning believing for something? And then the second thing that I see immediately is that once they saw the light, that they began to pursue the light. And they were persistently, I thought my wife was going to preach my sermon this morning, but they were persistently pursuing the light. Yes. They, they didn't just say, oh, isn't that beautiful, of uh, that great light in the sky. And I think it means a king has been born. Yes. But they, didn't, they weren't satisfied with that. Uh, to imagine to journey for two years, and in order to follow the star, if I'm right, you don't see a star in the daytime. And so you have to travel at night, 
where there's uh, more things, it's scarier, uh, it's more dangerous, and then you have to apply yourself, and they begin to follow and to pursue this star, this great light, because there was a promise. Somebody say there's a promise. There was a promise. They were seeking a, a savior, a king, who was to be born. And they were following after that persistently, pursuing, searching, and following the star for two years. What do we see from this? We must desire to get closer to the Lord. Yes. We, we must desire uh, and consider to draw closer to the light. But not just desire, but pursue, which is different. Yes. Merriam-Webster, as I looked it up, defines to pursue as to chase. Good. Yes. To, to chase, to, to follow, to track someone or something. In other words, they weren't going to give up. They were like a dog tracking uh, a, uh, 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 a rabbit. <laughs> Whatever it might be. They were, they were pursuing. They were following. They were tracking uh, something. They were swiftly moving after it. And it suggests this. A continuing effort to reach or to attain. Yes. This morning, in the midst of the hurriedness of the Christmas season, are you reaching to attain what God would have for you? Yes, are you reaching to attain, to get into the great closeness and the presence of our God Almighty? Are, are we pursuing the light? Why is it so important that we pursue the light? Because the enemy wants to keep you in darkness. Hidden from the truth. You see the truth, the, the, the light reveals the truth. <coughs> the truth of where that doorpost is when you get up in the morning. If you don't turn on the light, you'll find out the truth that you have kicked it with your toe. Can yes. I get an Amen. amen. And you see that the light is very important and we must desire to get to the light because the light of the gospel will reveal the truth of God. Yes, that's right. And if our world needs anything today, it's the truth. Amen. You see, to the world there is no absolute truth. But pardon me, did not Jesus say that I am the way and the truth and the life. There was a man, I'm going to talk about the truth, but there was a man, an old farmer. He was a tight-fisted farmer back in the day before there were electricity. He was talking to one of his hired hands who uh, giving him a hard time because this young man was going to see a pretty lady that he was interested in. And the old tight-fisted farmer was giving him a hard time saying, Oh, well, why do you do that? Uh, when I went to court, and I, I never carried one of those. I always went in the dark. Yes, said the young man. And look what you got. <laughs> you see, there are some things that you don't want to be in the dark about. Amen? See, that, that, that old man had went courting in the dark. Some of you still looking at me like, what does he mean? <laughs> and he found out later in the light that there was some truth he wished he had done. <laughs> See, there's certain things you just don't do in the dark. <laughs> what does light do? It dispels the darkness. <laughs> it exposes the truth. And the enemy wants to surround you in darkness, in disbelief, not having faith in God. He wants you to believe his lies. There's so many lies that can be told in the dark. Yes, that's right. But when you know the truth, it's the truth that you know that will set you free. Amen. 
It'll make you free. Yes, free indeed. You, you see, we need to pursue the light. Our world needs the truth. It's confused. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Isaiah 5.20 tells us this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Yeah. You see, the more crooked and the perverse our world gets, yeah. the more we need the light. Yeah. The more we need to pursue the light. We could talk a long time about the power of light. We could turn out all of the lights. But most of us understand the power of light in a dark world. What is that light? What does it bring? Not only truth, but hope. Hope that there'll be a better day. Hope that my problems will, God can handle them. They're not too big for Him. Hope that man is not left to his own, but that God sent a Savior to the world. Hope that we are not uh, uh, here all alone, not able to make it, but hope that God has sent the Son yes. to help us find our way. Our world needs the truth. Look at your neighbor and say, we must pursue the light. We must pursue the light. As we look at these wise men, they never gave up. They kept searching they kept seeking. They even had to stop and say, have you seen the star? When we kind of lost track of it. How many knows that at times in our life, I'm speaking to somebody right now, that we lose sight of the light. We lose sight of what God would want for us, of His Spirit, how it uh, wants to draw us to Him. We lose sight sometimes of the light, but thank God His light continues to shine and we can follow after Him and we can find Him. Look at your neighbor one more time. Say, pursue the light. Pursue the light. The wise men said, we have seen His star. His star. I read it so many times. And I thought it said the star. The star. No, it said we followed and we saw His star. It was His. No one else was to have the limelight. We, we cannot be a star in the presence of the King. There's no room for another star. <laughs> He's the star. He's the one. He is the, the, the showcase. He is the star. It was His star. So many times we forget. We think it's all about us. All me. All mine. How many times do we deal with problems that we lose sight of the light? All we see is darkness around. Folks, it will raise our head <coughs> and look up. Yeah, we'll see His star. Oh, Hope for all mankind. That's what the Bible tells us. Hope for all mankind. His star. Yeah. Too many times it's about us. And this star was bringing a great revelation. Not many saw it. But the wise men who were seeking, seeking and searching saw the light, saw the star, bringing the revelation of a holy child, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the King. He has come. Yes. He's come for us. Yes. The hope of all mankind. The Christ, the splendor, who left the splendor of heaven to be born in a lowly estate. As the carols tell us. Not born in a palace. Not born to earthly rich parents. Did not wear costly apparel. Had no earthly crown. But yet the heavens could not 
keep from declaring the glory and the majesty of God Almighty who had come, Emmanuel, God with us. He is here, the Savior of the world, the hope of the world. He is here, and the heavens are declaring His glory. Have we missed it? Have we missed His light, His love, His hope? His light, His star. Have we missed it? Like the heavens, are we also declaring the glory and the majesty of God? Are we pointing others to the light? I want you to see that these wise men were not just curious. <clears throat> they came with a purpose. They came to see His star and they came to worship Him. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you come this morning? Was it to see the pretty Christmas outfits that the kids had on? Was it to see your neighbors? Was it because you love Christmas carols? Was it to see what that pastor of yours has been doing for two weeks? <laughs> Why did you come? To worship Him. Yes. To give Him glory. To give Him praise. Can you join me? Yes. To give Him honor. We come, Lord, to worship You. We are drawn to You to your love, to your light. And we come with a purpose, Almighty God. To worship you. You deserve all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. None like you, O oh God. We seek after you. We search after you. We follow the path and we find you and we worship you and we bow down before you. Declaring that you are the king of our life. Imagine the wise man in the presence of the king. Didn't look like a king. Wasn't dressed like a king. He was dressed like the Lamb of God. Those swaddling clothes. Those shepherds knew what they symbolized. For when a baby sheep, when a baby was born, they would wrap it to protect it so that it would be spotless, without blemish. And here before them is the Lamb of God. Huh. And these wise men, these rich, probably majestic men, could do nothing. But take a knee yeah. and worship him. Yes. I mean, we'll say this morning, he's worthy. Yes. He's worthy to be worshipped, worthy to be praised. Yes. Hallelujah. See, worship is one of the most powerful ways that you can pursue God. Yes. It, it's one of the most selfless acts of seeking God. Worship takes on the posture of bowing our plans, our interests to the King of Kings. And when self gets out of the way, here's the problem. Have you seen his light? Maybe you are overshadowing his light. Your will, your desires. You see, when self gets out of the way, we can see his light more brightly. Look at your neighbor and say, pursue the light. Pursue the light. You see, worship will change you, but not only you, it will change your direction. After the wise men gave the gifts to the Messiah, gold, frankincense, and myrrh that we sing about in the carols, tells us that they worshipped Him and they departed another way. Once you have encountered God in worship, you'll never be the same. 
you'll walk away different. You'll, you'll follow a different path. Yeah. Because you have been in the presence of the King. Yeah. You've been in His presence and, and it can't help but it changes you. The things that used to be important to you are no longer important. <coughs> King Herod had told them to come and give him word of the king that he might come and worship, but in the presence of God. There was a warning. Don't go back. You see, King Herod was a very evil man. You read about him in the Scriptures. I heard about him so much this past few weeks in Israel. Do you realize that he killed his wife, had her murdered, killed two of his sons, all because he was worried that some, hear me, that somebody would take his throne? Yeah. Only one deserves the throne yeah. of your heart. So we must sacrifice self, our own will, our own plans, our own desires, that we might see His light, that we might encounter Him, that we might depart in a different way. But we learn from these wise men, pursue the light, but the shepherds teach us another lesson. They teach us to be the light. Yes. What do you mean, Pastor? Be the light. Luke 2.17 says this, Now when they had seen Him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. What does that mean? They told people. They spread the light. They told the good news because they had encountered something that changed their life. The way they would view the rest of their life. And they become the light. We get to spread that light. We get to spread that joy. Spread that good news. Behold, a child is born. Yeah. A son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Yeah. The angel thought, good news. Great tidings of joy. See, it's not enough to see the light or even to pursue the light. We must be the light. The truth is the world has lost its way. And if we are not the light, who will be? Light helps people see the error of their ways. But hear me. The only way to be effective in shine, shining the light is to be closer to the source of the light. How many of you like to go out and see the moon on a clear night? And, and, and you see that it is shining, and especially a full moon? Let me rock your world. That moon is not shining at all from its own source. It is merely radiating the light from the sun. The closer it is, the right proximity, the right angle, it shines even brighter. Are we close enough to the source of the light? Are we shining? Are we being what God has called us to be? Carriers, reflectors of the light. Look at your neighbor and say, be the light. You see, no matter what's going on around you, no matter how you feel, be the light. Make a difference in the world. Shine the love and the joy and the peace and the light of God. Don't be afraid to stand up, to stand out and shine the light of God. No matter how insignificant you may feel that you are, the world is watching you. Shine the light. Look at your neighbor and say, be the light. Be the light. People are watching you to see how you act and react. Yes. How you face the issues and the problems of this life. And they're looking for authenticity. 
They're looking for the real light of God. Pastor, are you correct in saying that we are to be the light? Philippians 2.14 says that we are children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Are we being the light? Don't let your light be snuffed out. Don't let the circumstances dim or diminish your light. I want to tell you something this morning. The light that is within you is greater than the darkness of this world. He that is within you is greater than he that is in the world. There is a light. The presence, the power of God inside of us. Are we making a difference? Are we shining? Are we reaching a world that is dark? Tracy, you can come to the piano. You see, there's different kinds of lights. What kind of light are you? I look around in the Christmas season and I see all kinds of ornamental lights. Hmm. Used one time a year or on special occasions. Are you that kind of light? That's only a special occasion light. I see trees blinking on and off. So many Christians nowadays are on and off. And on and off. Driven by emotion. Driven by how things are going. Are you a blinking light? On and then off. On and then off. The world wants authenticity. To see a real light shining. Are you a flashlight? Very productive, very useful when things are going bad. But not productive all the time. Are you a candlelight? We love candlelight this time of year. And there's nothing more pretty than a candle sitting inside of the house. Look at yourselves. Look at your neighbor. You're looking at candles inside of a house. Inside of four walls. But if we can only shine in here, how much good are we to the world? If your light is not focused, if your light is not, uh, if you're not pursuing the light, if you're not pursuing the presence of God, when you go out into the world and just the slightest wind, if you're a candle, it'll blow you out. Pastor, what kind of light do I need to be? A beacon light. Like you see on a lighthouse. Have you ever been by the seashore and see a lighthouse? It's always on. And in the darkness, and in the troubled seas. And it shows us the way. And it gives us hope. And it gives us our bearing. Are we that kind of light? Consistent. Can somebody depend upon you to be what you say you are? Or are you easily going in and out? Not being the light. That God's called you to be. All of us are called to be reflective lights. <coughs> what does that mean? The source is not our strength. It's not our goodness. It's not our positive thinking. The source is God. And when we reflect His glory, reflect His light. As I was driving down Beaumont Circle the other morning, early, before 6 a.m. to go to a Bible study, just had gotten back from Israel. They weren't out before I left. But the Christmas, the trees were just lined in lights. People are drawn to the light. There's something about the light that just 
draws like a bug to a light. Right? Are we that kind of light? Look at your neighbor and say, pursue the light. Look at him again and say, be the light. Pursue the light and be the light. This morning, Christian, as I prepare to open up the altars for a time of prayer, we used to make lights Sylvania, lamps actually we call them. And if they got dust or dirt inside of the solution, they just didn't work right. Sometimes we can get the dust and the dirt of the world and it'll diminish our light. There's nothing like a time of worship, a time of prayer before the Lord that'll just brighten our light. Today I want to come, I want to invite you to come spend some time in prayer and worship. The most visible, visible example we have in the Bible of the light shining from a person is Moses. He climbed up to the mountain for 40 days there in the presence of God. God speaking to him, God giving him the law, God giving him his purpose and his plan. And when Moses came back, he had to cover his face because it shone so much for the glory of God. Wouldn't it be awesome if Christians would have to cover their face because of the glory of God? 